Welcome to the Orion X Download. This is a podcast where we discuss big ideas and big trends in high technology. Hi, thank you for tuning in to the inaugural Orion X Download podcast. Inaugural. It's the first one. I'm Dan Olds here with uh, Shaheen Khan. How you doing, Shaheen? Very well. Great to be here in this inaugural podcast. Hope yes. you guys enjoy this uh, podcast. I hope we enjoy it too. I think we will. So how often are we going to do this, Dan? I think we were talking about doing this for uh, doing this two of these a month, once every yep. two weeks. And then as the, uh, the fever swells for more and more of this, probably doing it once, twice a day. <laughs> it will. It's just going to be a 24-7 channel. Yeah, something like that. So right. why don't you tell them a little bit about what we're going to be covering in these podcasts? So we're going to talk about big ideas in tech, what's changing, what's new, and any insights or revelations that we identify that we think is interesting and can impact your uh, investment strategies, the way you look at the market, the options that you consider. And we're going to bring in guests to probe specific items and uh, go all around the technology spectrum. Absolutely. And I think one thread that runs through pretty much everything we do on the research side is that we're out there on the cutting edge, the leading edge, maybe even the bleeding edge of technology. We sure are. I mean, we've done projects in AI and deep learning and IoT and cryptocurrencies and cybersecurity. And one of the things that happens when you do that for a few years like we have is that you know you start being able to connect the dots in ways that uh, can really bring in value we hope and along this the same lines doing the same kind of stuff in data center hardware all of that as well indeed indeed hpc data center yes so what are we going to talk about today well today we're going to share some of the uh data from our survey report uh, we did a survey a few months ago uh, looking at HPC and large enterprise, but sort of a different look at HPC, um, much less of the folks that are in the nonprofit HPC, which is like research labs, academics, etc., and really concentrating on the for-profit HPC, which is along the lines of manufacturing, uh, automotive, um, healthcare, financial services, etc., Right. I think that's what uh, probably most of you guys in our audience refer to as industrial and commercial segments. Yeah, yeah. And let's take a look at this first slide. You can see how the demographics came out. We had 154 total respondents. And if you take a look at the dem demographics, government uh, research is very low. Academic is very low. But we're really hitting manufacturing, uh, engineering, uh, industrial business to business, technology sector, life science, etc. And these are the folks that are using HPC for profit. It sure looks like it. And they also represent pretty big companies by and large. Yeah, you can see that from the total employees um, with the majority with more than 1,000 employees and a good slug of 5,000 to uh, 99,000 employees. So we're getting some ultra big companies in there as well. So That's ta great. taking a look at the next slide, uh, we're drilling down then in the demographics as to what our respondents actually do. And it's important to do this, to make sure that your respondents in a survey like this are intimately familiar with what's going on in IT. And as you can see, the vast majority are managers. Um, and looking at the respondent responsibilities, a uh, large majority of them are in the loop on IT budgets. They make platform decisions. Uh, they're part of the plan process so they really know what's going on yeah and, and and we know some of you guys are listening on the audio track only uh, so we'll speak more graphically so to say yes so some of the questions we asked here are do you recommend applications do you recommend platforms uh, do you make application software decisions are you responsible for SLAs how much of a detailed knowledge do you have about your selection process are you part of the IT planning process are you in the loop on IT budgets? Do you make platform decisions? And by and large, the responses are overwhelmingly above 50% are in the areas that demonstrates that they are uh, they are intimately involved with the 
with the selection process and the direction of IT. Yeah. Let's hit the, the next slide. This one asks about total physical servers and um, the majority, large majority at about 45% have 500 to 2,500 physical servers. Another 32% have 2,500 to 5,000 physical servers and about 7% have 5,000 to 10,000 physical servers. Right, and uh, I think that last one probably also includes those who have bigger than 10,000 servers because yes. there are a couple of questions later on where they certainly sound like they do. In fact, this very next question where we asked about uh, their clusters and um, for over 40%, actually, let me put it this way, um, more than 80% said that they have a uh, fair number of medium-sized clusters, which is defined as 48 to 100 nodes. Um, we had about, I'm going to say 70% saying that they had large clusters, which are hundreds of nodes, and um, over 50% saying that they had very large clusters, thousands of nodes. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And I think it basically shows that the industrial commercial segment is quite familiar with HPC. Yes. Uh, they are using big time clusters to do it. That's not the only thing they do, as we'll find out later. Um, but it is, uh, but, but they know what they're doing and they are doing yes. big stuff. And then we go into the areas that we surveyed. This was a long survey. If any of you out there took it, <laughs> yes. apologize for that, but it gave us some great data. And, uh, in broad strokes, the areas we surveyed were data center spending plus customer workloads and trends, vendor preference and presence, system vendor system and vendor differentiation, and then customer challenges and constraints. And today we're going to talk about data center spending along with the customer workloads and trends. Right. And if you guys are interested in vendor preferences and presence, what people think of that in that segment or how they differentiate among vendors and systems, uh, send us a note, contact us, and we'll cover it in a future episode. And that contact information is at orionx.net. So let's jump in. IT spending, uh, total annual spending, uh, vast majority here were $500,000 on up. Uh, with a, with the majority of those over 50% in the $2 million to $10 million category. Uh, we did have about 12%, uh, $10 million to, to $50 million, and probably some of those even more than $50 million. So those are clearly really large IT yes. departments. Yes. And uh, again, the, the large majority say they expect their budgets to go up over the next 18 months anywhere from 5% uh, to 10 to 20%. In fact, 20% of them, uh, actually 25%, said that they expect their budget to go up anywhere from 10 to 20% or more over the next 18 months. And the total buying power of the survey respondents is just over a billion dollars. So Good cross-section. Good cross-section. So what are they going to be spending it on? And on the next slide, we ask them, what are you going to be spending more on next year, meaning this year? And storage. More than 50% will be adding storage, which isn't a surprise because with all the data flying around, storage is something that uh, you're just going to consume. Yeah, you know, one of my rules uh, has always been that nobody's, uh, nobody de deletes anything. Yes. Uh, you never know when you're going to need it. You never know what is quite different in this file compared to another one and storage just keeps adding it does Unlike cpus and gpus where you go in get your stuff done and you leave with storage it just keeps adding mm -hmm. uh the next in most uh next preference is about 43 percent upgrading existing systems then a couple of interesting ones at just under and just over 40 percent accelerators both fpgas and gpus that's really new, and it obviously indicates how profound an impact GPUs and FPGAs and kind of the general category that we at Orion X call high-density processing is doing to uh, IT infrastructure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely make, having a big impact. You know, it's becoming a de facto standard component. There was a time when you kind of used the GPU if you were playing games 
or if you're doing really high-end 3D graphics, mm-hmm. over over the past decade, it's become more and more of a standard component in IT, and I think that's a really big deal right there. I think it is, too. It's it's not for scientists anymore. Right on. It's It's into the mainstream. Definitely, and of course, there are new databases out there, and not some, not not so new, that are using vectorization and GPU-based uh, SIMD instruction sets to accelerate database activities. You put a, a column-based database on a GPU and watch it scream. Exactly. I mean, exactly. it's it's orders of magnitude faster than what you can do without an accelerated database, a regular relational database. It's incredible. So moving ahead, uh, we asked about system usage. And in this, we're sort of asking about all of the muscle groups in IT. And uh, you'll see what I mean as we go through these categories. We asked about, uh, are you doing this now, real-time streaming or communication-intensive applications, visually intensive applications, numerically intensive, query-intensive, and transaction-intensive. And... uh, vast majority of customers are doing all of those. Yeah, I think that's really interesting too. So, you know, we divide the workloads into, like Dan said, specific muscle groups. Six different buckets here. Yeah, transactions, queries, numerical, visual, you know, audio, video, multimedia, and then communication, which is just mostly moving data around, and then real-time, which is doing all of the above in a streaming real-time fashion. And it's interesting to see that uh, the mix is pretty even. You know, yeah. There was a time when commercial guys didn't really quite do a lot of they 3D didn't, graphics. They didn't or, do visualization. Yeah, or they numerical. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then the manufacturing type guys weren't doing an awful lot of transaction processing or uh, communication intensive apps, for instance. Right. So this also indicates that you are doing a lot more multidisciplinary, if you, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. workloads that are adding more value to, to, to commercial users. Uh, the one thing I'd want to point out, though, is take a look at query intensive, which we define as data warehousing, business intelligence, decision support, and other forms of analytics. That's kind of head and shoulders above the others at close to 70% using it. Yeah, and I think that says this is a new growth area, mm-hmm. that they are trying to get value out of all the data that they have, and that's complementing their existing workloads. And we're going to see that in the next slide where we drill down a bit deeper into applications. If you look at the chart on the left where we ask them if they're running lots of this, um, take a look at data warehousing business intelligence. About close to 50% say that they're doing an awful lot of it. Yeah, exactly. I think lots of it is the operative word on this particular graph. Yes, lots uh, is they're, the, they're the doing, key word. They're doing all of it, but not you know lots of everything. Yes. And of course, they're commercial industrial guys, so they're not doing lots of engineering design. They're doing some engineering design, mm-hmm. but they're doing also traditional commercial workloads. Yeah, you look at number two being CRM, and I'd imagine there's quite a bit of analytics in that. That's true. That's right. Then you get to the more traditional structural analysis coming in at about 33%. Then we see kind of a new entry, machine learning and deep learning. Right on. That's like right over 30% of them are saying they're doing lots of that. So that's another indication. And quantitative analysis and risk management is the is the next one down at about 28%. Then you get into more of the traditional you know, seismic uh, protein modeling, engineering analysis, etc. And so if, all of those are above twenty percent. Yeah. Then we asked them what they're not using, not doing a lot of, and um, sort of the research side of research and development, like engineering analyses, other scientific simulations, things like that, um, are what they're not doing so much of. Yeah, I think our our our. Um, summary of this uh, finding is that in the R&D world, they do more D and less R. It's a capital D and definitely a lowercase r. Right. And so then we asked them about growing application areas, and we we gave them the, the list of the same things that we had on the previous charts, data warehousing, business analytics, ERP, et cetera. 
and um, data warehousing business analytics came out quite a ways ahead of everything else, especially if you lump in the separate business analytics question with the data warehousing question. That's a pretty big number of folks that that are saying that that's the growing, the fastest growing application. It's their number one growing application. Yes. So we, we wanted them to prioritize it, and this is the number one growing application. Something like 23% of them say data warehousing, business intelligence, and right behind it at you know 12% is business analytics. Right behind it at just below 10% is risk management quantitative analysis. Right behind that is about the same 9%, 8% ERP. So this basically says that uh, they are trying to put a lot of effort into where the business value of big data is. Mm -hmm. And the business value of big data is really in traditional data warehousing business analytics that they can advance and transform and enrich, but uh, not throw away, basically. So essentially what we're saying is that the big data wave is not anywhere close to being over. Customers are still trying to get there. That's right. That's right. And of course, like you like to say, we as industry analysts tend to be a little bit ahead of actual market. And of course, that's kind of what our what our role is. Uh, but it is important to not confuse trends with reality. Yes. And take a look at machine learning, deep learning. Uh, that's under 5%. So what we're seeing are people kicking the tires on it and starting some projects. But it's in terms of the number one growing application, not very many people cited it. That's right. That's about, that's about 4% said so that's their number one growing application. It's uh, important, but kind of behind some of the other apps that are helping run the business and bring in immediate business value. Yeah, which I I, I th don't think should be a surprise. No, no, no. And of course, you know, for that 4 or 5%, it is bringing business value. And that's yes. really what is important there. Well, I would say that that 4 or 5% are probably the folks that have, at least in their own minds, conquered the big data and they have control of their data. Now they're applying AI and machine learning to it. Absolutely. I think the whole big data thing should be viewed as a workflow, if you will, or mm -hmm. multiple stages or a roadmap. Yeah. You know, that you start with, uh, you know, you start with what you have in data warehousing and business intelligence. You add on top of that things like Hadoop and Spark, and you add on top of that various other kinds of analytics. And then you graduate to AI and machine learning and deep learning where the real value is going to be. You know, and if, if you look at this with the very long lens that 10, 15 years ago, uh, maybe a little longer, people were just trying to get their stuff into a database and have right. all of, the, all of the, the transactional things that would work with that database and starting to analyze it. And uh, now we're to the point where it's all in a database and we're really trying to drill down and pull out some really usable insight quickly. Right and on, right and then on. the next so, stage is where the machine does that. Yeah, you know, uh, along those lines, one of the one of the refrains that we have here is that uh, digitization means lots and lots of data, and making sense of lots and lots of data is either an HPC problem or an AI problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, we wrote a paper that says how that describes how those two disciplines are actually pretty similar from a algorithmic, computationally. Uh, uh, you know, challenging uh, standpoint. Yes. Uh, so that's definitely the case. And we found that most of the for-profit HPC folks, big D on terms of research development, little r. Right on, right on. So this is maybe a good segue into summarizing what yeah. we learned from this segment, right? So one thing I learned is that the commercial industrial guys do more HPC than meets the eye. They, yes. They've got clusters, they've got their workloads, and HPC is definitely uh, creeping into commercial industrial workloads in a bigger way than perhaps is imagined. Yes. And I think that, that you know, most of the market surveys you see probably don't catch all of this. That's correct. That's correct. Because it's, it's a very difficult market to track. Um, I think it's really interesting that customers are still trying to get to that nirvana of having control over all their data. So that's why we're seeing so much emphasis still being placed on data warehousing, business analytics, et cetera. 
Yeah, that's right. I think big data is definitely the new growth area with AI and machine learning. But within that area, we're seeing that the commercial industrial guys are more focused on where immediate business value is. Yes. And yes, that's absolutely. Really advancing and enriching their existing systems with data warehousing and business intelligence uh, and not like throwing them away to go down the path of the new stuff yet. So it's going to have to be complementary to what they're doing, transformation and integration with existing apps. Exactly. I think you're, you're absolutely right on that. So I think that's all of our learnings out of this. Um, we'd like to encourage you to write in with questions, comments, anything that you'd like to share with us or anything you think that uh, we should cover in upcoming shows. I mean, we have from now until forever to do this. So we're probably going to run out of some topics just using our own brains. So we'd love to tap <laughs> yours. That would be great. Well, hope you enjoyed this. And uh, Dan, uh, that concludes our inaugural episode, doesn't it? It does. So we've got one in the bank and we'll have another one coming at you in probably two weeks. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>